Young Israel of Brookline, yibrookline.org. Hey, all right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Let's, uh, let's begin. So we're up to Perak Zion, the book of Ezra. This is now the second half, so to speak, of the book of Ezra. We're going to now meet Ezra. This is when uh, Ezra is going to... Uh, a lot of buildup. Exactly, going to appear. So just to review, though, the first six chapters spans um, about 18 years, maybe a little bit more. It's the beginning of when the Jewish people first come under the Edict of Koresh, King Cyrus, and they begin building some sort of community. They lay the foundation of the base of Medesh and begin offering sacrifices on a, on, a, on a Mizbech, on an altar. But things get slowed down. There's tensions with the people living there. They can't build the actual base of Medesh. And then 18 years later, um, under the reign of Daryavesh, um, uh, they get, uh, they're encouraged by the Nevi'im. Daryavesh um, sort of, uh, you know, officially approves their work again. And they're more successful, and they build the base of Mikdash, and, uh, and they inaugurate it. Okay. And with that, Perak Zion begins. Ba'achar hadvarim ha'ila. And it was after all of these matters, all of these events, the first six chapters. B'malchus artachshasta melech paras. Under the reign of artachshasta, the king of Persia. Now, again, uh, the Malvim here, again, notes just sort of two traditions how to understand this. Chazal and the Gemara seem to understand that Artach Shasta is a general name for a Persian king. And this is still Daryavesh, which would mean that the events we're about to describe is happening soon after the previous Prakim. But uh, other already classical Mufarshim and, and uh, the historians believe that this is the Persian king um, Artaxerxes, however you pronounce it, um, which is a king or two later, and which would mean this is about 50 years later. And in some ways, that's a simpler understanding of the Psukim because we'll see we're, we have, uh, you know, so to speak, a whole new cast of characters. I mean, in the first six Prakim, Yeshua the Kohen Gadol and Zerubavel, these are the leaders, everything is happening, you know, under their guidance, and, and, and now they're gone, they're not there. So, um, you know, it'd be strange if, uh, you know, sort of these major leaders, they sort of, uh, you know, they disappear or, uh, so, so either way, uh, however exactly number of years have passed, it, it's clearly sort of like the beginning of a new era, a new period, um, and, and we'll see. Okay. So again, in the, in the reign of Artach Shasta, Ezra, who is Ezra? Ezra, ben Sraya, ben Azaria, ben Chilkia, ben Shalum, ben Sadok, ben Achituv, ben Amaria, ben Azaria, Ben Mirayot, Ben Zrachia, Ben Uzi, Ben Buki, Ben Abishua, Ben Pinchas, Ben Elazar, Ben Aharon, Hakoin, Harosh. So he's a Kohen, and it goes back to Aaron, Hakoin, Harosh, Kohen Gadol. Yeah. Why did they break up the Pesukim into these three name chunks? I'm not sure. I'll be honest with you. I'm not 100% sure um, the source of that Messiah even. In. I'm not well, sure. Because the Pesukim are not full sentences is an example right. where normally a Pesukim means a full sentence here grammatically, but these Pesukim are not full sentences. Well, Chilkiyahu was the Kohen Gadol of the Interesting. So, so the Mephorshim point out that there's a parallel lineage of Ezra um, in Divrei Hayam, which has more names. So they assume that even this is, is an abridged version. And if you count up the, the, the names, I think there's like 17. And if it's going back <laughs> to... 14, I got 16. Okay, okay, so I'm not sure. So, so uh, well, even that seems to be not enough name. to get back to our own. So the, so really the point is, these are, these are the more famous yeah. names, meaning these were known people. So, you know, who is a sen Ben here might mean more descendant than, than immediate son of. Right. Okay. okay. Okay, so, so now why is pedigree also important? Perhaps we saw in the previous program, there's also some discussion of, you know, the lineages and pedigrees have been sort of, you know, jumbled a little bit. And it was also important to establish that, you know, Ezra has this excellent pedigree. He knows exactly where he comes from. Um, you know, there's no doubts about him. <clears throat> now, who is this Ezra? That sort of identifies him by his lineage. Who Ezra? This is the famous Ezra. Allah mi Bavel, who came up from Babylonia. Vuhu Sofer Mahir Bitorat Moshe. So Sofer we normally translate as a, as a scribe, and it, he, he probably was a, a minimum a scribe, but in the context, it's been clear it means more than that. It means like scholar. And Mahir means um, 
adroit. I just saw that translation right now, meaning my hair limit is like quick, but it means like skilled or, or, or uh, let's see how they translate it. Ready. Ready. Okay. I like my translation better. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Nimble. Yeah. Right. Nimble. Yeah. Very adept. Yeah. But again, means not just in terms of like his calligraphy and his able to write yeah. a Torah, but no, his, no. right, exactly. No, no, no. Exactly. Uh, of the Torah of Moshe. That God gave, God the Jewish people gave. Just in case anyone's confused. Right, exactly. That one, that one. Rich Torah. That one, yeah. Okay. And so he was this great scholar. And he was very successful in dealing with the Persian authorities. He was, he was uh, an adept political leader. And the king gave him whatever his requests were. We don't see it, we don't hear explicitly, but we can sort of work back what, what you know, what the requests were. We're going to hear what the responses was. We don't, we don't have the recording of the request. Kiyad Hashem Elokavalov, as the hand of God was upon him. That's a phrase that's going to repeat a lot in this parak, meaning, meaning, you know, as Hashem was taking care of him, meaning he was successful and he got the king to do whatever he wanted, you know, as Hashem was, was guiding events. Okay. So how is Ezra identified? What are his, um, you know, you know, qualities that are praised here. He's so fair my here, right? So he's, he's a scholar. Yeah. So if you think about that, it, it seems, I don't want to overstate this, but there's a bit of a transition here in the sense that um, we're now at the very end period of Nivua, okay? And we're sort of moving more into, you know, the second temple period, the second base of Migdash with sort of the you know, development of the Torah Shaval Peh, eventually the Mishnah is at the end of, you know, but uh, moving into that, into that period. So Ezra seems to be, we're going to see this sort of like a transitionary person, Chazal definitely saw him in that way, that he's not being, he's not the great Navi, he's not the great prophet, he's, he's the great scholar. So uh, again, I don't know what's not well to say, but, but it, you know, I don't know if he's the first, but uh, maybe he is, sort of the first person that's identified. Um, he's not a, he's not a prophet, he's not a king. Um, uh, he's not a show fate, you know, basically, like, we would use the words Tamil Chacham. They didn't have that word yet, right? The great Tamil Chacham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was all, and he was also going, but, but yeah. So now before we continue, in terms of who Ezra is, so flip to the back of page number two. So we'll hear how Chazal um, sort of describe Ezra. So the Gemara says like this, Rabbi Yossi Omer, Yossi said, Roy Haya Ezra, Shetina Saint Torah Al Yado Li Yisrael. Ezra really was worthy, was fitting to have been the individual through which the Torah was given. Il Male Kadmu Moshe, but like Moshe beat him to the punch. I Meaning he, right? He really, he, but his, right? But in terms of who Ezra was and what he was, he, so he was someone who um, was worthy to have the Torah given through him. And there's a parallel between Ezra and Moshe. The Moshe who Omer, regarding Moshe, the Pasuk says, U Moshe Allah El Ha'elokim. And Moshe went up to God on Har Sinai. Similarly, Rabbi Yossi says, Ba Ezra who Omer, regarding Ezra, we just read this Pasuk, Hu Ezra, Allah mi Bavel. He came up, he went up from Bavel. Okay, the, 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 we're just trying to find Pasuk in the parallel Moshe and Ezra. Ma Aliyah Ha Amor Khan Torah, just like uh, Moshe was going up to receive the Torah and give it to the Jewish people. Af Aliyah Ha'amor Lahalan Torah. So too, Ezra went up to Eretz Yisrael for the purpose of, uh, yeah, giving the Torah. Okay. But Moshe, who Omer, regarding Moshe, it says, Va'osi Tziva Hashem Be'esahi, and God commanded me at that time, Lila made Eschem to teach you, the Jewish people, Chukim Umishvatim, laws and statutes. That's Moshe's essence to teach the Torah. And Be Ezra who Omer, and regarding Ezra, a pasuk we'll read in just a few minutes, it says, Ki Ezra heichin levavo lidrosh es Torah Sashem. Elokav. And Ezra prepared his heart to, we'll, we'll just say, teach, explain the Torah of, of Hashem, Velasos, and to perform it, Ulamed be Yisrael, chok u mishpat. And to teach chok u mishpat, like Moshe taught chukim u mishpatim. Pause, let's pause here for a second. So the, the Gemara seems to be creating this parallel between Moshe and Ezra. And 
the impression you get, we have one more line to read, is that Ezra was like almost like a was like a Moshe Rabbeinu figure for his time and place. And in a way, the Torah was almost given again. Now, that's in two ways. One is, as we'll see, Ezra comes and just everyone is ignorant. People don't know the Torah or mitzvahs. People are intermarried. And he's sort of re-giving the Torah in the sense of reteaching it to a people that has forgotten it. Okay? So that's one level, I would assume, of what the Gemara means. And again, so Ezra's um, uh, quality of excellence is, again, his teacher of Torah. Okay? Now let's read one more line of the Gemara. Va'af al pi shalom nitna Torah al yado. And even though the Torah wasn't given by Ezra, nishtana al yado haksav. It was under the direction of Ezra that the script of the Torah changed. Okay, I'm not sure if people are aware of this. Hmm. So there's, there is an ancient Hebrew script. Okay, the same letters, but they were written a different way. The, the, the scholars here, there's a, there's a chart here called, it's called Paleo Hebrew. Okay, so you can see, you know, just what, uh, you know, the Alf by Gimel, and you can see on the, on the side that, you know, that script that looks, I don't know, it has kind of is more of an ancient feel to it. Um, so that is how Hebrew was written, right? The Torah was written that way. That was the script. So why did, why did, why did he have to change it? I'll be, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not even sure what the historians would say, but it's clear at some point, the, you know, from a historical perspective, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, oh, maybe they were using the other script. I mean, they may, they may have been speaking Aramaic, but maybe they were using it, maybe the script that we have today is really the Aramaic alphabet. I'm not sure. Well, the Gemara does say, the Gemara, right, so the Gemara does say, we don't, the Gemara continues and says, our script is called Ketav Ashurit. Oh, yeah. And the Gemara says, why is it called Ketav Ashurit? Thank you for reminding me. Because Allah Imahem May Ashur, from Assyria, meaning in Bavel, Persia, Assyria, all those names are sort of blended together. Um, so, right, so the way the Gemara presents it, it seems like it's saying that it was sort of a script that they picked up um, in Babylonia, meaning maybe in, in, in Babylonia, that was a script that they used. And these are all like Semitic languages, they're all sort of related. And then when they came back, they, um, they brought that script with them. But, what, but then what right did he have to change the, the writing of the Torah? That's Excellent the question. So you have to assume there was either, uh, the Gemara finds allusions in the Torah that the script can't change. Um, um, you couldn't do it today. Correct. So either they had some sort of tradition or there's some sort of prophecy. There were still some prophets. But you're right. The Gemara doesn't really explain how they knew they had the right to do it. You know, to, to ask it very halachically, so you could ask it like this. There's a mitzvah to write a Torah. There's a mitzvah to have tefillin. So when Hashem gave the Torah to Har Sinai, tefillin meant in Paleo-Hebrew. So, so how can they just change tefillin? Or how can, you know, you know that's not tefillin then. That you can't, you know, uh, make up your own symbols. So I don't have a better answer than to say other than, um, again, the Gemara does seem to say there was some tradition that at one point it would change. Um, the Gemara says like Mishnah Torah, the phrase Mishnah Torah from the Torah, Mishnah, which from simple understanding means re repetition, can mean like Shinu, like to change. The Torah, that will change, mean the script. Like today, we're afraid to change anything. Right. Because we don't, we don't have, we're missing part of the tradition. Yeah, presumably they had, they definitely probably, they yeah, definitely still have some, for sure, this, you yeah, know, uh, these people, they're, again, they're people, well, maybe on Ezra's day, but, uh, you know, people that, uh, you not from the first base. If you have a Torah written in Greek, that was in the proper translation of nutrition, that's technically a kosher Torah, and if you... Well, you can fulfill the mitzvahs that way. Torah, so to a certain yeah. extent... You're right. There so you're right. There is some concept of, you know, you can do things in translation. Yeah. So here, as we went a little further, because he sort of like officially changed the, right. yeah, I hear what you're saying. So you don't change the language, you just change the Yeah, script. this is the script. Again, it's the same letters, same it's words. Like, it's just how to write. You know, it's like you have the printed Hebrew and you have Russian. Exactly, have exactly. Hebrew. But the, the Chiddush is that you could change the way a Torah should be written and fulfill the mitzvahs in that way. I think there's some sort of, without me you know, the kind of, some sort of Kabbalistic, uh, thought that the, the shape of the letters are, are primordial to the creation that we live in. And I had heard that it's the letters that we have now are the ones that represent that the most uh, perfectly, although I don't know. Yeah, you know, so again, it's, it's convenient. So, 
Yeah. Well, you have to learn again, right? Doesn't um, Rabbi Akiva have a whole thing where he looks at the It's a very good question, Matt. It's a very good question. Yeah. So the, actually, unfortunately, we're going to ask, because there is some disagreement in the Gemara. The Gemara, the Gemara clearly knew that there was this ancient Hebrew script. It wasn't they, they knew that. This is not like some surprising thing that Dark Gale just dug up recently. Yeah. And there are different opinions in the Gemara exactly how to put that together. So, um, and when it changed, or if there was a point in time when they had both. But the Mepharshim asked certain questions because there are certain Gemaras that on some level seem to be assuming that the script we have now was the original script. Mm. So there are two Gemaras. One is because the Gemara says, um, first of all, Rekiva darshaned the crowns and there are only crowns on, 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 the, new on the new ones. Yeah. Um, and in Rekiva's day, they already had a new one. And but he was Moshe, but Moshe, came from Moshe. Again, in that Gemara, yeah. it's not a halakhic Gemara, but the Gemara says Moshe went and Sorry, keep it doing that. So, um, and there's another Gemara that says that the Mem, Sofit, and Samach in the Luchot were a miracle because the middle stone sort of hung in the air. In there. Yeah. So that's also assuming that it's, that it's the current script. Yes, very good. Yeah. So oh, the Gemara said. So the, the, the Gemara says that the tradition was that the letters of the of the two Luchot of Parsini it was it was carved all the way through the, the tablets. So let's say a, a, a final oh, men, oh, 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 oh. right? So oh, if you carve a circle, so but so the middle part was just hanging. That was a miracle. Yeah. In, bo in both, in both Luchot. The second one, Moshe wrote. I don't remember. Maybe only the first one. Oh, no. Wasn't there an additional miracle that it read the same uh, no matter which side? Yeah, it was like a hologram. Yeah. 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 So, so, I, so anyways, the Mephorship, sorry, so Mephorship say some say, um, I didn't look this up, but apparently it's a Talmud Yushalmi that says, yeah, according to this view, there was such a miracle, but it was the ayin, because the ayin is, uh, mm -hmm. is closed. Wow. And oh. some unfortunately want to say that, you know, maybe even though the, the general typical script was Paleo-Hebrew before it changed, but they had the first script also, and maybe, you know, certain special holy things would be written in our current script. So, I mean, you see this, I mean, currently, like in current day Hebrew, we have, yeah. the, we have the letters that we write, that we hand write, which are very different from the yeah, ones Yeah, I hear you're saying, you're, you're right, you're saying there can, all, there can be more than one script in use. I mean, you look at it even, even in, in, like, you know, uh, Roman engravings, like, Again, those letters that they're writing the like, into the into stone are not uh, the same. They would are, use are not the, something that you would you would hand write with a with a feather with a quill. Um, yeah, so, so that's what. Okay, still so more even more wiggle room. Yeah, here you're saying. That's a very good point. Yes, yeah, so that's what that's what I remember. Who one one first says that um, mm. they they you know again like you're saying that they they even originally had and used at least in some way the current script. Okay, uh, so yeah. I, I do question that there is all conflicting. Yeah. There's a, a, in a couple of places, a few places, Rashi says that, that the wording that we have is a, 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 a can of correction. Deacon Sofran. Deacon Sofran. Is that Ezra's yeah. work? And the second question is. I don't is think he, so. Is he clear Not in the Torah. Putting the dots or is that the Masoretics? Um, the dots, like there's some places, the dots, I don't know, I'm not sure. That might be. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, so what is the the Gemara on, on at face value means what it says that um, the, the the script changed under the guidance and leadership of Ezra. But again, I would assume the Gemara also means again. You see, like Ezra was this sort of revolutionary figure and transitioning the Jewish people and the Torah into another era, and that was partially symbolized by the fact that the script is changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's why he's like Moshe Rabbeinu in some sense. And we find that Chazal, you know, attribute um, many, many takanos to Ezra, like that he made certain enactments, certain enactments regarding reading the Torah, Kriyasa Torah, and mm -hmm. the Rambam writes, I'm not sure if this is explicit in Chazal anymore, but the Rambam writes that it was Ezra who based Dino that enacted the text of Shemona Esrei and enacted the basic law, they have to make a bracha, um, before and after you eat. So again, Ezra is sort of, you know, these things didn't exist. I mean, there was the spirit of the law and I'm sure people were religious and thank God when they ate, but in terms of having sort of set laws um, or a set text of how to pray. So, you know, that developed at some point in the second base of Migdash. So, um, you know, Ezra is sort of the, the first of that period. And that's also what it means that Ezra is like Moshe Rabbeinu. It's not just 
that he was reminding the people who had forgotten the Torah, reminding them of the Torah that already existed. But to some degree, he is, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, taking the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm trying to be, you know, careful with the exact words I'm saying, but taking the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, and uh, to some degree, you know, reformulating it or or bringing it to sort of a new historical period. So he's like Moshe Rabbeinu. It's it's almost like there's a new Matan Torah. It's based on Sukkim. We have to read more Sukkim and Ezra also. He's going to have a whole covenantal ceremony with the, with the Jewish people, but but this is part of it. So so two quick questions. One is um, well, the first one. There's a divergence between. Moshe and Ezra perhaps is that Moshe was also a judge of the Jewish people. You see how the, in Sanhedrin how they compared. Yeah. Whereas I'm not sure Ezra was like a judge. We're gonna see. Maybe he, he was. He, he, well, yeah, because he's gonna be a sort of a political leader figure. So we'll All right. see. The second thing is, I mean, in terms of people who foster traditionalism versus yeah. change, if you yeah. want to call this the opposite ends of the spectrum, yeah. this would, uh, uh, this would, uh, um, indicate that change is can be healthy or, or yeah. at least practical in, in Judaism, even a pretty fairly revolutionary change, depending on the needs of, of the context. Yeah, you know? I would agree. So it has to so, be done under sort of the direction yeah, of the kind of person. Yeah, I mean, if it's authority and and the needs are seen as as uh, as demanding, I mean, maybe there's nothing contraindicating absolutely again the de like uh, the devil's always in the details and what yeah. can you change how can you change but yeah but in terms of the basic idea you're right and that's what the gemara is saying ezra you know the gemara is picking out you know ezra is this, it doesn't but it doesn't happen also every generation right meaning meaning this, well, this is, it a is a very special era. Thing. this was a new era i mean they were they were just the second temple had already just been rebuilt, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that's a dawn of a new era. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, it's not surprising that the dawn of a new era, sort of, um, the way the Torah is sort of applied is gonna be, is gonna be a little different. Okay, so let's go back now to Perik Zion of Ezra. I think we're just gonna, I have Perik Zion and Chassir, we'll probably just make it through Zion this evening. Um, so we're not to Pasuk Zion. Vayalumi bene Yisrael, umina koanim, vahalavim, vahameshorim, vahashoarim, vahanesinim el Yushalayim. And with Ezra come regular Jews, Kohanim, Levim, singers, gatekeepers. The Anitzim are the sort of the, the um, servants and workers of the base of Mikdash to Yushalayim. When do they do this? Vishnasheva la artach shasta hamelch in the seventh year of the reign of Artach Shasta. Vayavo Yerushalayim b'chodesh ha-chamishi. They arrive um, at Yerushalayim on the fifth month, that's Av. Many people assume that's um, also purposeful. I mean, Av is known as, was the month of the destruction of the Yisrael and they're coming to sort of fix that and rebuild it. Ki shnasa shviis again, the seventh year of the king. Did yes. They, did they fast on Tisha B'Av that year? Right, that's, <laughs> the, that's the question. Did they fast once the base of Mignesh was rebuilt? Mm, good yeah. question. Yeah. Or Salvechik has this beautiful essay. I'm not sure what the exact source is. It's somewhere in the Tisha B'Av um, Kinos. Uh -huh. He says that um, there's some tradition that they did fast. So how could, how could they fast? Do they, the base of Mignesh was rebuilt. Well, yeah, but the first one was well, destroyed. They, they You're right, so the, uh, it wasn't as great. Fine, it wasn't as great. Yeah. So he, the way he says it, though, is that I remember the phrase, like, the, the shadow of Tisha B'Av was looming in the sense that there was, a, there was this tradition that the second base of Mignesh could potentially be destroyed. The third will last forever, but the second could be destroyed. And they were like always worried. And again, they weren't like we're seeing here. They were they were under the you know the power of other authorities. They weren't totally independent. And like sort of every Tishba when it came around, they started like being seized by fear. Lying in their graves again, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you maybe know, they'll get up and maybe they won't. Yeah. Right? So that's so that's what he said. Yeah. That's why they fast. But I'm not. I'm not of other uh, rulerships we still live. Yes, yeah, so maybe Tishlev would be different, right? Those are, that's referring to other ones. Yeah, I'm sure other, I don't, other people I think assume they didn't fast um, a Tishlev when the base of were built. Okay, let's continue. Um, so they arrived in Av. Ki be'echad l'chodesh harishon. It was on the first of the first month, Mirosh Chodesh Nisan, two days ago. Hu yesud hamala mi bavel. 
So there are two ways to translate that word. It's an interesting word. Either it's like the Yisod Foundation. That was the foundation in the very beginnings. They, they gathered together on Rosh Chodesh Nisan to leave to, from Bavel. Others say Yisud can be actually from to congregate, like, um, uh, what are we saying, Davni? Like, Misod Chacham, how's that, William, how's it go? Uh, right, so that, so, so, so that can mean like, they sometimes translate as like council, but it means like the, um, the no, no, it means like the gathering. It can mean, it can mean like sort of gather, so it can also mean actually gathering. Um, uh, for example, right, Rashi says by, by, uh, by, um, when Yaakov is giving the blessings and curses to the sons, he says, um, I can't remember, but uh, he doesn't want to be mentioned. He doesn't want to be mentioned by a Do you remember talking about David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't but want to name. It's usually in a negative sense, so gathering. Well, there means gathering, but I'm just saying the word so can be gathering, okay? We don't, I don't want to get too distracted, but the word so can be gathering. So some understanding means when they gather together on Rosh Kodesh Nisan to begin the trip. So they started gathering together Rosh Kodesh Nisan and they arrived Rosh Kodesh Av in Yushalayim. Again, that same phrase, with God's hand upon him, guiding them, protecting them. That was the passage that the Gemara Sanhedrin had quoted. For Ezra had prepared his heart, and to do it and to teach it. Law and statute. Now the word lidrosh is also a very interesting word. How would you translate lidrosh as Taras Hashem? Anyone want to, uh, to explain? To explain. That's not like we would colloquially think, like a drasha, right? Medrash. So the truth is the Shoresh Darash in Tanakh, um, say at least other than this one place, does not mean that. It means to, you'll see there's obviously a connection, but Darash means to, to sort of investigate or to seek out or to find. So for example, it says, V'darashta v'chakarta heitev, the, the the basin, if there's a case in front of them, the basin must, you know, investigate and interrogate well. Or um, uh, does anyone here, um, Jeffrey, if you can you find in the end of Perak Vav, there's a phrase, Lidrosh HaShashem? So, oh, in the end of Perak Vav, it's the previous Perak, I don't have it on my... So um, it means to sort of, again, seek or find. So um, Rifka the Pasuk says, Batelech Lidrosh HaShashem, the babies are kicking. She goes to seek out God. Either she davened or she went to the Navi. So in Berak Vav also there's a similar, there's a, another use, similar usage that the Jews have gone, gone, come up to Yishalayim to seek God. So it means to sort of seek, investigate, look into. That's how it means in Tanakh. So here, now, so Lidrosh Es Torah. so if it means to sort of investigate, look into, analyze, that, that makes sense. That's using the word in the same way. And clearly at some point though, that sort of transformed into not just studying and analyzing and looking into the Torah. Oh yeah, but so dumb, I'll tell you that right, okay, yeah. Um, um, but it became sort of that to teach and explain it, which is really a totally different meaning, right? You're no longer looking into it and, and, and dive, delving into it, you're, you're teaching. And, then, and so, uh, you know, and then that, that's how we use the word now. Right to give a drasha, I'm not, right? I'm, I'm the person's teaching, he's explaining. So that's how I would think this. That's what I, I, I to me, that's what this. Um, so I'm not everyone agrees with this, but uh, to me, the summary of the pasuk is like that, where this word darash is being used now in the new way. And again, this is an example of Ezra's a very late book, one of the last books of of Tanakh. So you know, it's a language is sort of evolving, and so by now, you know, the word is just using it in. In a different way. It's just a, it's just a technical point, but sort of just you know, interesting to point out. I think. Yes. So whether he was actually um, explicating or or investigating, researching yeah. the Torah, so he's very knowledgeable. Right. Yet he acquired all this knowledge in Babylon, right? Yeah. So that was the like the new plus ultra of learning. So in, how was it that number one, there was no one left in the land of Israel who who could challenge or match him or if there was and number two why was his authority accepted in israel if he was you know from a five-month journey away why politically was he 
not challenged, or why did everyone sort of drink down and accept him? You know? Okay, so let, let's we'll have to see. Let's see the procedure right. when he does get there. Um, but you're right. Um, um, he came late. He came he late. late so it's interesting. So again, the way Chazal lines it up, um, Chazal say, again, this is based on, on that chronology. Chazal say that Ezra was a student of Baruch ben Neria, who was the student of Yirmiyahu. Baruch ben Neria is in the book of Yirmiyahu. And he was a student of Baruch ben Neria. And the Gemara actually asks, why didn't Ezra come up right away if he's such a tzaddik? Um, uh, you know, why, why is he coming in this later wave? So the Gemara says, um, and this fits into the whole personality we've been discussing of Ezra, as you see, the importance of Talmud Torah, that uh, he was still learning from Baruch ben Neriah, that's what the Gemara presents. And, um, you know, he felt he, he wasn't ready to go, and it was only when Baruch ben Neriah, his Rebbe, died, he came up. So again, that's, that's, that's a big lesson for a lot of, since like the 18th century or whatever, for people yeah, to figure maybe, out what to do their lives. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So again, that's another one that you see sort of uh, the association of Ezra and Talmud Torah and studying and teaching and so forth. Okay. All right, let's continue. Now, I apologize. We have another brief, brief interlude of Aramaic. This is really it, I promise. Okay. Okay. Vizet Parshagin. Hanishtavan, and this is the text of the letter, Asher Nasan HaMelech Artach Shasta, you can see there's like Hebrew, put in, you know, there's a little bit of mixed Hebrew also, that the king Artach Shasta gave Ezra HaKohen HaSofer. Okay? Sofer, Divrei Mitzvot Hashem, the scribe, the scholar, the teacher of the words of the mitzvot of Hashem, the Chukav Al Yisrael, and the statutes of Israel. What is the text? Artach Shasta Melech Malchaya, Artach Shasta, king of kings. La Ezra Kahana, and this is directed to Ezra the Kohen, Sfar Data, like Dat, the, the, the scholar of the, of the religion, Di Elakashmaya, of the God of heaven, Gemir Ukaenet, etc., and following, or something like that. Nini Simtain, for me there is a decree. The, so let, if you try to remember the previous decrees of Koresh and Daryavish, and we'll see each decree keeps getting better and better. Daryavish was better wow. than Koresh, and we'll see this one is going to even be better than Daryavish. He called mit nedav b'machusi. Anything that's um, uh, anyone who, who who wishes to volunteer for my kingdom, min ama yisrael the Jewish people, the chahanohi and their priests, for leva ye and their, their levites, limhach yushlam imach who wants to go like walecha to yushlam with you, yahach he can go. You're allowed to leave. You're you're allowed to emigrate to another country. Kol di. And all this comes din min kadam malka from the king, the shivat yaatohi, and from his seven advisors, yaatohi's advisors. Shaliach that Ezra, you are the messenger, the agent, levakara al yehud to again check on. We have this last name bikor levakir means to check, to check the Jewish community of Yehuda, Vidu shalayim. Bidas elakachti bidach, according to the law of your God, in your, which is in your hand, meaning I'm appointing you, I'm giving you authority. Um, uh, you know, it's clear Ezra is going to, to basically take over. It seems like things, you know, are not working, are, are still not really working out well. We need like a restart. And this is, this is a letter of giving Ezra political authority, not just against any other nations that they can't interfere, but that he should be accepted as the Jewish ruler. So actually, to your point, Philippe, part of the reason why he was accepted was he convinced Again, we don't have the request, but clearly he was asking our Shasta, can you appoint me to be the Jewish governor? And he's being appointed to be the Jewish governor. With political authority came religious as well as with his scholarship, right? Yeah. Yeah. safu dahav, and you can bring silver and gold. Again, dahav, dines and zahav, and switch just like zahav. Dimalka viatoi, from the king and from the advisors. Hisnadu lelokai Yisrael, that will be donated um, to the God of Israel, Dibu Shalim Mishkanei and Yushalim with his temple. V'chol kesaf, so everyone can go, you can take money, and I'm appointing you, Ezra, to be the, uh, the governor, so to speak. V'chol kesaf, v'dahav, di tahashkach, v'chol medinat bavel, and all the gold and silver found in, in Babylonia. Im hisnadvut ama v'chanaya misnadvin, whether it's coming from Babylonian um, uh, donators or it's coming from the donations of the Jewish people. The base Ella Kahon Yushlaim to the God, to the house of the God of your God in Shalim. Kol Kabel Dana, all of this, Asparna Tikne 
the Katsu Denai, you should immediately buy with your silver, Torin, oxen, Dichrin, rams, Imrin, sheep, Umin Chason, meal offerings, Viniskehon, wine libations, U Sikarev, Himo Al Madbacha, and you should offer it on the altar, Debeit Ela Kachon, Dibushalayim, and offer in the house of your God in Yushalayim. Uma di Allah the al echach yetav, and whatever is good for you and your brothers, whatever you want, the shark haspavadava with the leftovers of the silver and gold, lemebad, you can do whatever you want, kirut ela kachon tabdin, whatever the will of your God is to do with. Umanaya di mit yahavinlach, le palchan beit ela kach, and the vessels that should be given to you for the service in your temple, hashlame should be given fully, kadam elaka yushalem. So it seems again, they, they still had some of the, temp, the, some of the vessels. Are you saying it now? And, and take the rest of the vessels. Again, just coming back, you know, the, the, I mentioned it last time, but again, you just see where the, like the Medrash, you know, Nachash Verosh, that they had the vessels. So again, it's clear that part of the Chalar coming from these Pesukim, like you just see from the Pesukim themselves that it was a big deal. Like they had some of the vessels, they gave some of them back. They, were, they, they still had some. So that's where it's coming from. Usha'ar chashchus beis alakach, and what, whatever other provisions that you need for the house of your God, diya pelach, lamintan tintain, whatever needs to be given should be given, min beit ginze malka, from the storehouses of the king, umini ana artachshasta malka, from, my, my, from me myself, artachshasta, the king, simtem, I'm giving it a decree, l'chol gizbaraya, to all of my, um, how do they translate it? To all of my, uh, you know, uh, treasurers, yeah, thank you. Di Bavar Nahara, on the other side of the river. Di Kol Di Yishael Chon, Ezra, Kana, Sfardata. I'm telling my treasurers, whatever Ezra, the priest, the scholar, asks for. Di Elakash Maya, for, the, for his God in heaven. Asparna Yit Abed. You should immediately do it. Give it to him. And here are the limitations. Ad Kasaf Kikarin Ma, up to 1,000 talents, I believe they translated as, of silver. Va'ad chintin korin ma'a, a hundred cores, that's a certain measure of, of flour, of wheat. Va'ad chamar batin ma'a, a hundred measures of wine. Va'ad batin meshach ma'a, a hundred measures of oil. Umelach di lo ketav. And salt with no written amount, unlimited salt. Whatever, however much salt he wants, he can get. Okay. Kol di min ta'am elakash maya, and whatever is the decree of your God, yit aved ad razda, should be fulfilled immediately, lebeit elakash maya in the, in the temple. D, four, lama lehevei ketzaf, why should there be wrath al malchus malka ubenohi, upon the kingdom of the king and his sons? Mm. Meaning, so on some level, again, he maybe believes in many gods, but you know, he's saying, I was yeah, you should take yeah, care. Yeah. Let your God have what he wants. Right. But the Yemish also is, you pray for me and exactly. my sons too. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, it doesn't actually say that yet. That you're right. Question. He doesn't say it in the same way. He doesn't say pray for me, but he seems to believe. And again, maybe this is something First among equals, what Ezra said. I guess, Israel was, right? right. First among equals, maybe? Yeah, maybe. All right. Supporting religious freedom. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and not, but not only out the goodness of his heart, he believes, you know, um, he doesn't want to get any God upset. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's good motivation. Yeah. Cold D. I mean, we don't know. Say, we don't know what Ezra said because we're gonna. It'll be more interesting. Um, thing we heard class, but you know, you know what you know. Ezra might have told him. Might have given him the speech about. Um, our God uh, pays those all of those. Us, exactly, right? yeah. exactly, exactly, and, and, well, and vice versa. Isn't it conceivable that Ezra could have said to the king, you may not know this, but our God destroyed Egypt. May, yeah. Yeah. Destroyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're actually going to see. I'm, 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 I'm going to even, I'm going to even, so I'm gonna even I'll, I'll even jump ahead. So, at, well, let's just read one passage from Perichas because we have it in front of us. So when they're traveling, they're traveling, and let's read Pasuk Chaf Aleph. So if you're looking at the Hebrews, the third to last line. So they're getting ready to actually start traveling. He says like this. Ve'ekra sham som al nahar ahava. And I declared a fast by the river in Ahava before we started traveling. Li'itanot l'shnei alokeinu, to fast. Levakesh b'menu derech to pray for 
you know, a straight path. For us and our children and our property. Now let's do this. Ki boshti lishol min parashim. Because I was embarrassed to ask the king for an armed escort. He could have, but he didn't. Why not? To, to, to protect us from our enemies. Why? Because we told the king, I told the king, Yad God helps those who, you know, are righteous. And his anger and wrath is against people, you know, who, who uh, forsake God. So it seems like we get this little snippet. It seems like whatever his speech was, that was part of the speech that, you know, our God protects and rewards those who are good and those who are not good, he, you know, he, he does it. But are you saying so, he so that's why he... For, for not asking? He's doing tshuva for a fast, right? No, well, he, so, so I mean, he's saying, he's saying, but he's saying, but really, I really know, you know, you're not allowed to rely on a miracle. Yeah. He really did need an arm escort. And uh, if I would have, I would have, I would have tried to like to figure out a way for the Artaf Shasta to, to give it to us. But I couldn't because my, my whole uh, speech to Artaf Shasta was, we believe in our God and our God will uh-huh. repay those, you know, based on how they act. So maybe so he's that, fasting. So, that so they're, they're just, they're just fast. Yeah, they're just fasting for a safe journey. Yeah, that's why they're fasting. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying, exactly. So, so, here, so maybe that connects to, you know, what Artaf Shasir is saying. And he's saying, let him have it. You know, let your God have it. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, upset. Yes, he can make it to Israel safely. So the thing right, is, then, is then that means he's Artaf Shasir is not demanding tribute, is he, from, from Judea. No. He's not, um, he's not uh, doing it, is he doing it so that there will be, peace in his kingdom. Something like that, it sounds like. And he's also, there may be some sort of blessing return, even if it's not a material thing, yeah. unto the emperor, right? Correct. All right. Yeah. Those are, so these numbers that he gives us, you know, how much oil and, you know, the gold and the salt. How much is that? Is that like a significant, you know, investment? His well, part is that sort of like, you know, I can hand this out to any other tribe who comes to my life. So life. He's, did you say I'm a thousand sure. talents of silver a year, or was it 500? Because thousand. Haman 100. says 500. 100, 100, 100, 100. Because doesn't Haman say that he'd be willing to pay a Hashverosh some like a, a 100 talents of silver, or 500 talents of silver, which is, which is some, it's something like $50 million in monetary. I don't know. I assume there. it's a lot, but I don't know if he would give it that. Oh, that's related to that Mazak with the check, all that Yeah, silver. exactly. Yeah. Okay, let, 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 let's continue, though. I want to let's get into the pair. Kufta Aleph. Ulechol Mahodein, and to you, Ezra, I am telling you, Dikol Kanaya Vilevaye, all your coins and ladies, Zmaraya, your singers, Taraya, your gatekeepers, Netinaya, the workers in the temple, Upalche, or any other servant space of the Kadana of your temple, Mindavalo from now and going forward, Lo Shalit Lumirme Alihon, no one may have authority over them. Now, that might mean just they can't tell you to stop, but many of them also actually understand that mean you cannot be taxed. You're, you're, no one has authority over you. You can't, uh, the Persian tax collectors can't come and, and ask you for, for money. Va'ant mm-hmm. Ezra, and you Ezra, kechachmas elakach diviadach, according to the wisdom of your God in your hand, many shaftin v'dayanin, you should appoint uh, in, uh, officers and judges. Di lehavon denaya l'cholama, to be judges for your people. Di v'avarnara, in the area on the other side of the river. For all those who know the laws of your God. If they do not know, you should let them know, you should teach them. So again, he's, he's, he's giving Ezra official authority to sort of like take over control um, of the Jewish community. Meaning, uh, you know, I'm giving you, I'm giving you that authority. So that's also beyond, you know, uh, the previous requests of Koresh and Daryavish. And so clearly, presumably Ezra was asking for this. Again, maybe he, he knew things were not going well. They're not observing the mitzvot. In general, the, the, the community is not organized and not doing well. And Ezra realizes he needs to go and sort of reorganize and, and get things straight. And, um, and so he comes to Artaf Shas. And one of the things, it's working backwards, that he asked was, you know, appoint me to be the governor. And so that, that's, what, that's what he does. Okay. And anyone who will not abide by the laws of your God, or the laws of the king, meaning me, he's saying, 
Dina Immediately, there should be a din. He should be judged. How should he be judged? The punishments could be hein lamot, to be executed. Hein lishroshi, that means literally, literally to be uprooted. The Gemara seems to understand this to mean to be excommunicated, to be, to be banned, to be kicked out of the community. Hein la'anash nechsin, a monetary fine. Vila esurin, and that either means jail, like, you know, uh, or some understand to mean like uh, lashes, like isurin, like uh, suffering. Period. End of end of the letter. So I'm giving you full authority, Ezra. You're in control. You can do uh, you can do this. And then Ezra concludes, Baruch Hashem Elokei Avoseinu, blesses the God of our forefathers, Asher Nasan Kazos Belev Hamelach, that places in the heart of the king, Lefaer is based Hashem Asher Rishalayim to glorify the house of God in Shalayim, the Alai Hita Chesed Lifnei Hamelach Beyoad Sav. And God, um, uh, you know, placed his kindness, how do they translate this? You know, his like charm, Mercy. yeah, yeah, upon me before the king and his advisors and his officers. I mean, he made me successful in, in dealing with them. And I, I strengthened myself, you know, with Hashem's hand upon me. That, but saw me Israel Rashim, and I gathered together other leaders um, of Israel. Laalo see me to come up with me. Interesting switch switched to first person. It is an interesting switch. And from here on, a lot of Ezra's, and uh, it is an interesting switch. Sure. That's also a difference, again, in the style of Ezra and Nehemiah, again, it's like a late book. And in terms of that, like, sort of style, um, you sort of you see, you see that difference compared to other books of Tanakh. So, something else that, that's weird. So, from his lineage, Ezra would be a co the Kohen Gadol. Okay. Or, because he's a, he's a direct descendant of Aaron Cohen. So he should be the Kohen Gadol, and he's gotten himself to be the governor. Now, it's not quite the Melech, but, but this caused major problems. In the I hear. I hear. So, it's, so, especially for somebody who is so highly esteemed, it's very interesting. I hear. But by Ezra, we see it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it doesn't seem like it caused problems with Ezra, but it's a, Wasn't it actually going at all? Uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure. There are different. Because Lydia is definitely qualified. Like, well, you look at this Lydia. Yeah, I think it's unclear. I think there are different opinions. There are different opinions. You're now reminding me, I think there's an opinion of Chazal that another reason why he didn't come up right away is because he didn't want to cause friction with Yahushua Kohen Gadol. Like, um, uh, mm. um, but I think, I'm not sure. The different opinions if he actually was a Kohen Gadol. First of all, hi, Leah. I hear interesting Baruch Hatash Leah saying that Pasuk of Zion, Baruch Hashem Elokei Avuseinu, definitely echoes a little bit like Baruch Hatash, you know, the way we begin Shon Esrei or other Baruch Baruch. It could be, maybe. Rabbi? I would just say, I'm going to add to, to that because we are going to see um, that uh, it's going to be obvious to you. But when we read Perchas and, and we leave, Ezra leaves, they're going to pray for safety. And it, it's just feel a derech. Like there are certain key phrases from oh, the Fizadarech wow. that we say wow. is from, you like know, the Ezra's, original, Ezra's prayer. Yeah. So, so you do see that, um, you know, Chazal model, you know, certain prayers after Ezra's prayers. So maybe, maybe this is, you know, one of the sources of. Uh, of uh, the structure of Barachos. How, how much do we know of Ezra's life in, in Babel? And where are the sources that you get those from? Say it again, I'm sorry. How much do we know of Ezra's life in Babel? And where are the sources that we get that from? There's are nothing there in Any Tenhaz other Hazel. books? Like no. in, 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 not in the Megillah, he's not in there. In Daniel? 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 So, no. No. I'll have some traditions, but I don't think there's anything. So he's just like that. sort of out of the world guy. Yeah. Just, I don't know, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll stop here for this evening. Um, any further this, questions? Sure. This letter. And again, just before anyone steps out, so we're not going to pick up until um, a week after Pesach. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so this letter, is this a letter that Ezra would have shown to the people in Yerushalayim? So yeah, for sure. The, the, the Parachas is going to say that explicitly. It, Parachas is going to say explicitly, at least he showed it to the Persian authorities. Um, and I but assume he shows the Jews. Jews pre yeah, presumably. And are there are there any art archaeological yeah. artifacts like the cylinder of Scott Cyrus of this letter that exists? 
archaeologically not that, I know, that we know Not of, that no. I know of, but it could be. But not right. that I know of. Just to your point, uh, Haman pays 10,000 silver talents as opposed to the 100. Oh, yeah, so this is a... Uh, here. So wow. in terms of, you know, scale of... Economy. Okay, so, 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 so Haman, it was something like $50 million. So this would be the equivalent of about $500,000, just a little bit, a nice little sum of money. Right, so it's, it's a decent, you know, not for a king, but not breaking the bank. Yeah. Okay, all right, good evening, everyone.